I mean, the main thing that I believe in as a marketing person is before you go out and get customer, more customers, you need to retain the customers you have. Yes. And as a consultant, I would go into organizations and I say, well, once somebody has a transaction with you, whether it's on the business to business side or mm -hmm. retail or whatever that form, format is, B2B, B2C, what, what are you doing? And I found that there was a huge gaping hole. And so it was like, oh, okay, well, we can't focus on new until we make sure, number one, you have the right customers and that we're actively keeping those customers mm -hmm. or clients. And then we can come up with, with how to attract more of them. So I am so pumped today because I have Jen De Tracy here with Ooh. us. And uh, Jen, let's just get right yeah, straight let's get down to, to it. it right? Yeah, I, I heard you speak at uh, one of the networking events and you were talking about marketing. And I was so impressed with the, there were five tips and they were just so simple, but they were so profound mm -hmm. that I just... Thought I have to get Jen on, on my program. I want to. I want to talk to her more because yeah. I know this would be beneficial for uh, our audience. Yes, that sounds great. Yeah. yeah. So can you can you share how did you get into marketing? Like okay. that's what you're. Yeah. That's what you do. Yes. And like, what is your background? Like before you even yeah. get there, like you. you yeah. Twenty seven years. Twenty seven years. Like in marketing, that's kind of crazy, wow. isn't it? Because of the evolution of what's happened over time with marketing. You, tr you know, my life started off in a state of what am I going to, to do? I was, I was in high school. I struggled with a bit of dyslexia. My mom was trying to find a right program for me. And she said to me, well, you know, we'll pay for your first year mm. of education. So I found a one-year program <laughs> as a pharmacy technician. And I, I thought, okay, this is kind of a good place to start. I didn't do any research on it. I didn't realize that that wouldn't be in line with living with dyslexia because the drug names are like this long and I couldn't pronounce them. So I passed the program and I got out into the world and I was like, wow, this is not for me. How do you, hang on a sec, before you go on, <laughs> how does someone with dyslexia, because I didn't even know that, that yeah, like this yeah. is all new to me. How does someone with dyslexia do in a program like that where like you say the words are so long and you said you passed was it easy though did you oh, have to it get was tutoring hard. no it was hard i yeah. i guess my the dyslexia i have is 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 minor but it's enough that i lacked confidence mm. at that stage in my life i thought i was broken i had to repeat grade seven uh because my mother thought it would be the best thing and uh you know it was like i just wanted to get out of the house it was a program i could take mm. If I, I was told when I did some testing that pharmacy looked like a good area for me, but they didn't layer in the dyslexia as a factor. Mm -hmm. And I had a great year and I met great people and I lived in residence in Red Deer, Alberta. And I worked my butt off and mm -hmm. I would write, I would study for the test every week that we'd have and I would do well on it, but then I couldn't retain the information. So I'd pass the test. I'd get like eight or nine out of 10 for the drug names, but I could not retain it in my head. Mm. So when I went and did my practicum in the hospital where everything is in the drug names versus the generic names, so that would mean acetaminophen as opposed to Tylenol, the brand name, I was hooped. They did not think I was very competent. Plus, I had to push around a drug cart on my last week of the month there and deliver drugs to everybody's rooms. And I came back with half the, the cart was still full of, of drugs. So that was not a good career for me. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I stuck it out because, you know, you grow up in a family, you work hard and you just don't complain and you, you make it happen. And I had some good bosses that I was working for, but I realized that wasn't for me. And I saw these women coming in in these really nice suits, like they looked really put together. And they'd come into the pharmacy because I worked at a retail pharmacy and I thought, I want to be like them. They're confident. They look great. They, I never talk to them because I'm only a 20 year old person just creating the story in my head. And I decided to go to business college and my parents had moved to Ottawa and I, I thought, okay, I'm going to go to Ottawa. I'm going to apply. I got in and I didn't research anything about being a drug rep. I didn't know until after I finished college that you need to have a science background. Oh, <laughs> And, uh, but I went through that and that's how I discovered marketing. I took accounting, retail management and marketing and I fell in love. That was 21 years old, fell in love with marketing. 
okay, so can I ask you, how did you get into, because you were a part of the team that promoted Sarah McLaughlin. Yes. How did that all come how did that to come be? About? Yeah, how yeah. did that? Well, I had, I had, my second love is music. Mm. And I was doing radio in Ottawa where I was going to school. Um, and I was going to Carleton, I wasn't going to Carleton University, but I was doing college radio, the best top radio station there. So I started off in the bathroom, broadcast, or started off broadcasting to the bathroom. And then once my to the bathroom, yeah, to the bathrooms on that floor. And then eventually they gave me an overnight show. Mm. So I would work all week and then I would uh, go to the, go to sleep on Friday nights and I'd get up and I would go to the radio station around 11 o'clock and I'd pick out all the vinyl because it was still records back then and mm -hmm. some CDs and I would pick what I wanted and I'd start my show from one till seven in the morning. I did that. And that's where I discovered Sarah McLaughlin. And she was just an emerging artist at that time. Her first CD came out. And I thought, oh, I love her music. And I love all the artists on Network Records. And I, Ottawa was, it's a bilingual city. I was not French. It was difficult for me because I'd moved around my whole life. Mm -hmm. So what happened was I said, I want to work for Network. And I went to Vancouver. And I went to this nightclub called The Railway. And a band was playing there. And there was a woman there that had worked at the radio station. I'm like, Sue. How's it going? What are you doing here? And she goes, well, I, I work for Network. And I said, how do I get in there? I want to know. And she said, well, you have to volunteer. And so I was just visiting. I went back to Ottawa, drove across the country with my partner to Vancouver about a year later, just grabbed a job in a record store at that time, right? And volunteered once a week at Network. In the week, I was hired. And so that's kind of how my music career began. At network records and then they right away I had two roles I was in charge of all of the mail the entire mailer department and uh, all of all everything associated with merchandise for Sarah McLaughlin as well as cold calling record stores across Canada my database being about six seven hundred mm -hmm. to convince them to bring in artists that they didn't know so that was an exciting time for me yeah, so that's it how I ended up in Vancouver. That's how it all kind of. So I had a dream. Yeah. I made that dream happen, and it was, you know, and it happened because you went after it. It went, like uh, you yeah. really asked, yeah, exactly. "What do I need to do? Yeah. How do I get in the yeah. network?" You, you know, asking, asking, and exactly, not and, just waiting for it to happen, and and doing what needed to happen. So committing to volunteering, mm -hmm. right? And one day they just called me and they said, um, "Well, we haven't seen you in a couple of weeks, and we have a special project for you." And they made me call all these record stores in the U.S. and do cold calling. It was my first time doing cold calling. Well, my second time, actually, but in that intense way. And I thought, wow, this is hard. And at the end of it, they said, okay, this person can follow through. Mm -hmm. And they brought me on board. So it was, it was very cool. So now mm -hmm. you are an entrepreneur. Yes. You have your own business. Yeah. And you are teaching other entrepreneurs how to market. And we... What I heard you when I heard you speak, you were, you were um, using the analogy on how your clients are very similar to fans, to fans of you know of yeah. singers and artists. Yeah. So, can you share a little bit of that? So how how yeah how is that you know how are you customers fans like right. how do you, right yeah how do we equate and and yeah. you know what's funny is that the word fan for customers because we've got social media has become commonplace now. Mm -hmm. But back when I was starting to put the systems in place, my five-step process, I was using that language before it was a commonplace thing. And I actually started out, I was teaching at Langara College, mm -hmm. and I started to put together uh, my program. And through that and through my consulting, I realized, wow, I have a consistent system. It's not like I went <laughs> and created a system, right? Mm -hmm. It's like I realized, no, I have all the pieces. Now I need to create the acronym and do it. And then I want to go out and I want to speak about it because another thing that's been important to me is is my dream to, as a child, I had this fantasy of being an actress. And the closest I got to that was doing magic shows, you know, putting on doing really? it, yeah, yeah, little wow. at home and just, you know, just uh, my uncle Like magic was, tricks. Yeah, magic tricks. Yeah. yeah, my uncle was really good. So mm. he inspired me. But So I knew that I just didn't feel that was going to be for me because I couldn't read scripts very well. And even though I love drama, I struggled. So... 
when I found out that there was actually something that people were getting paid to speak because I was getting out there and speaking regularly and I enjoyed it and won contests for it, but I didn't know that there was like a whole world of professional speakers and that you could get paid money to do that. Mm -hmm. So, and in the beginning, I'm like, well, what am I going to talk about? I wanted to do something really inspirational, but I couldn't figure it out. So I thought, well, why not talk about what I live and breathe, which is marketing mm -hmm. <laughs> and use this premise of building your fan club. And at that time, around 2008, it was like building your fan club during uncertain times, right? Because of the crash right. market. So I wrote the presentation and I traveled around BC and, and I did that presentation and it was it was based on five premises about how to i mean the main thing that i believe in as a marketing person is before you go out and get customer more customers you need to retain the customers you have yes. and as a consultant i would go into organizations and i say well once somebody has a transaction with you whether it's on the business to business side or mm -hmm. retail or whatever that form format is b2b b2c what what are you doing and I found that there was a huge gaping hole. And so it was like, oh, okay, well, we can't focus on new until we make sure, number one, you have the right customers and that we're actually keeping those customers mm -hmm. or clients. And then we can come up with, with how to attract more of them. So, and I don't know if with my, clan, cl with my clients per se, I use the word fans, but when I went out and I tr traveled around BC and, and taught people how to build a marketing action plan in one day with my big training manual back in the days <laughs> before online, um, I would then use the word fans because I wanted to get away from the marketing lingo. I don't know if you can relate to this, but when totally. I listen to my accountant, right, I'm like, you know, glossed yeah. over yeah. or a lawyer glossed over. But that's the over, artist, right? Okay, These, the, okay the, those of us who are more artistic yeah. tend to not, yeah, glaze over as soon as it gets into like, okay, this is dry toast, like uh, yeah. tune out. Yeah. But yes, well, that's why I think your presentation hit me uh, when you said your customers are, you know, turn your customers into raving fans. Yeah. I'm like, oh, that makes so much sense. And I personally get that experience every time I get a new client that they have that same issues you're talking about where they come and they're, they, they're like, I need more clients. I'm like, well, what happened to the clients you had before? They, they're just like, they only have a program where it ends right. and then now they're onto looking for a new customer. Well, you need to try to keep the customers you yes. have, give them, you know, the, there's yes. more you can offer them, right? Yeah. And yeah. make stack, them like stack value. Fans. Yes. And yeah. that's, I learned that, um, I became a business owner when I was working for a dot com and I got laid off and I was like, Oh my God, what am I going to do next? Right. Mm. Next phase of life. Scary times. So, <laughs> yeah. And I went, I ended up just getting into a self-employment program and mm. having someone who was very excited for me. And what I learned right at that point was I needed to have a consistent uh, retainer fee, mm -hmm. right. For clients, because I knew that the, I started my business in 2001. So quite some time ago, so over 16 years ago now, so that I didn't have to worry and also to get paid up front, mm -hmm. get the money first, because it can be very stressful if you want to, if you're, if you're doing the sales and marketing yeah. and you're also delivering to some degree yeah. and you're wondering where the money's going to come from. So I've been very, uh, I've been very consistent with that. So going back to um, like with the graphic designer, the project's over, what's mm -hmm. left, right? Mm -hmm. Or others, I saw others struggling with so much of this. Not that I didn't have any of that. I certainly right. have, but less of it and yes. less stress than other people, right? Having a strategy. Yeah. So that yeah. you don't have the big dip, but it's yeah. more about, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, and some clients only want to work with you shorter term and sometimes that makes sense. But in general, I find that even when someone, a business owner has a plan, the biggest thing is implementation, mm -hmm. whether it's th themselves or their staff. And so if they don't have a coach to, and someone to help assess, they don't most of the time succeed mm -hmm. at the certain level that they're at. And for me, like I work a lot with business owners that are trying to get to the 1 million or over or get to the two or 3 million. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, the solo business owners I have my program for, which is like an online program, so that's different. But I find with most business owners, if they don't have that consistent check-in mm -hmm. and, and assessment or, and what do you call it, recalibrating, mm -hmm. right? Because they'll do something, but they're like, well, it's not working. Well, no, it's not working because it, it can take 90 days for something to kick in. And I and in an overall plan, I, I liken it to 
conceiving a child and giving birth. So that nine month period of time is what it takes before you're really going to see an impact. And people just don't have the stamina or, or they're like, oh, well, I, I'm spending, you know, don't spend the money in the first place if you can't commit to doing something yeah. for that period of time. There's no point. It's a waste of money. You have, you have to, to have the you stomach have, you have for to, it. Yeah, you have to stick with it because yeah. the result comes eventually. Yes. Like it doesn't yeah. it doesn't happen or not. Can I ask you, yeah. uh, because I know that some of our listeners and viewers will, will, will go, yeah, this is all nice and dandy, yeah. but I'm just starting up. So so what would you say, like, if, if someone is just starting up, how do they create right. a raving fan? Like, right. how do you create that excitement right. around If they're just starting and they have no up? customers at all? They have no customers, but they right. have a great something that they're going to be right. offering a service or a product. Right. How, how, how do you build up to that so when, right. you, when you launch, you get, right. well, any tips that you can give somebody well, who's just starting out? I think the first thing is that you really have to get out there and network mm -hmm. because um, if you've got something new, you want to test drive it with someone, right, first and get feedback on it. I think the first time around, I know with my courses and stuff like that, I have gone out and in the beginning, this this five-step process that I now call Crack the Marketing Code, I didn't move it to an online program first, right? Mm -hmm. Just I'll just go through this and then I'll, I'll go back and ask that question in more detail. I mean, it started out as as like a one-hour workshop and then it moved into this full-day seminar and then it moved into, you know, and so on and so forth. Then it became a webinar and a teleseminar, you know, and I went through all the steps. So I think for a new, for a new business, um, first of all, once they get one client, right? So once they get one client is delivering amazing value. So that client feels happy mm -hmm. and they can do a testimonial. And that's, so that's one piece. The other piece that I've used over the years that I find very helpful is to have an anchor strategy. So let's say, for example, when I wanted to go out and do a presentation and just get my name out there, I, I locked in to get uh, one of the Burnaby Board of Trade, the Burnaby Board of Trade to commit to it, right? Mm -hmm. And then I was on the phone calling as soon as I knew they had it. I said, yeah, Burnaby Board of Trade is like they're having me speak. And now I'm going to go out and I went for Chilliwack and all the others, right, to, to get them all lined up. So really it's about really focusing on getting that first client or customer unless you're in retail that's a different kind of we're mm -hmm. talking consulting services right, right. that kind of thing um getting that first customer in but you know you, it's like going to a restaurant in the beginning right you walk by a new restaurant you see there's nobody in there and then like two years later <laughs> and two years later it's packed right i yeah. remember going to this place on commercial drive the wazubi right? Or zoo, what was called Wazubi. And there were like 10 waitresses and waiters lined up on either side of the door on the opening day in this huge building. And there was nobody there. Wow. And then eventually, you know, it was packed, right? So you have to have, number one, you have to have money in your bank account. You have to have it revenue while you go through that process. You can't just start a business and, and drop everything. I've heard people do that, but I personally... <laughs> would not recommend that myself. Well, it's not recommendable, but that's how I started. I yeah. had nothing. Yes. I literally so had can. nothing. So it's possible when you have that fire <laughs> under your ass. Yes, it yeah, is. Yeah, when it's desperation, yeah. yes. it creates yes. motivation and the right. innovation. Yeah, yeah, and it's, and it is inside. possible to, to do yeah. that, right? Mm -hmm. But for most it's people, not they're ideal. not in that, they might not be in that yeah. situation, yeah. right? And so having some other source of revenue or something <laughs> to go as they build, then there isn't the, the same kind of pressure, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, I had the self-employment program, but as soon as that funding dropped out, like, you know, you're kicked out of the nest and it's like, yeah, okay, no, no. <laughs> now I, I, I had to move. And that is yeah. a powerful place, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's any one right or wrong way. It's just deliver great value to the first client you have. Test something if you feel that you don't have the confidence to get the, to get the testimonial and make sure you've got things in place properly and focus on one industry or one sector, one area that you want to become the expert in and get one client and then the the world is your oyster once you lock one in because you then have something to talk about even doing a bit of pro bono work in the beginning at least you can talk to people and say well my current client blah 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 and it builds your confidence up right so i think it, whereas um if you have to say well I, i'm just starting my business that doesn't really people don't necessarily go okay i'll hire you so it's how you package yourself so you have yes. you can still be very truthful without yes. having to disclose that you're just starting out 
That's right. right. And and doing some pro bono work where then you can reference back to this client and say, oh, well, my, one of my clients that I'm working with now, they've had problems in this area. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is an area that I'm really, this is what I've done to help them. So it gives you right away legitimacy and confidence that you can right. stand tall and speak about it. Um that with ease, awesome. right? Awesome. That is yeah. so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I love it when I hear it from a marketing expert. I like, so I hear from different people and I, you know, I have my own personal experience, yes. but I'm not by any means a, a marketing expert. So it's right. nice to hear that's kind of you know, reaffirming. Yeah. Um, so now you, you, you talked about uh, an online program. Yes. So can you, can yeah, you absolutely. T- tell us more about that? Yeah, so what I did was I had this program that I tested a couple of years ago, and I called it Master Your Market. And when I went through that, uh, people paid to go through it. I did a webinar, and a small group of people signed up, Mm -hmm. and there was a mastermind part. And what I realized is it was quite big. So I wanted to take something into an online world and make it smaller. And it was the it's the five steps of the lift process. So and it's called Crack the Marketing Code. And what it is about is it's about Um, most people that have a business or start a business, they don't have a marketing background. Right. So it's about, first of all, it's about refibering people's brains to think like a marketing strategist. Because if you're not thinking that way, you're going to struggle. You're going to spend money where you shouldn't be spending money. You're going to put time and energy. In the wrong direction. Yeah, and you're not going to be focused. And that is, when you're doing it all in the beginning, that's tough, right? Mm -hmm. So the steps are, and I can just, I can even say what they, they are, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. That. So it's an acronym called LIFT. So the first step is LAYER. And that is, if you were to put, if you had an investment of $100,000 mm-hmm. and you invested in one stock and it tanked, you would lose all that money. That would be bad. Well, we kind of psychologically know that, right? But do we, do we think that way about marketing? A lot of people will do one marketing activity and they'll bank on that, and then nothing will happen. And, and then they go, it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> and part of the reason is that they're not layering their marketing initiatives, mm-hmm. which is the first step. And some people, they'll have, when they, when they write out what they've done marketing-wise over the last 12 months, and they list off everything they've done, they'll see, well, I've done a lot of stuff. I've done 20 things, but I haven't done anything well. So then again, that's not effective either, Mm -hmm. right? So it's about having the right combination and the right impact. And it's about what I call stacking. Maybe you start with one marketing activity and then you add another. So you start with going to a networking group and then you start with meeting people for coffee and then you start doing other things within that organization in order to create a greater impact. And then you add another layer maybe uh, by including social media to connect and you build those layers. And so that's the first step. Second step is inform. Inform is all about knowing what that core message is, the impactful message Mm. that you want to say. A lot of people, they get out to a networking group and they just, they haven't planned it. They don't know what to say. They don't know what's impactful. So inform is about understanding who your ideal customer is so that you can create a powerful core message. Mm. Now, it's always harder for startups. And with my program, truthfully, you really have to be into your business a couple of mm-hmm. years before you can do my program because you have to have reference points. And it's always good to have fallen on your nose a few yes. times, right? A little Hopefully bit of humility is good. <laughs> is good. We all have it, right? Uh, yeah. So that's the second step in form because you want to have a strong core message when you go out and you share that with people. And you want that to, to pollinate throughout your entire marketing um, roadmap or action plan. Mm-hmm. The third is very simple. It's about frequency. Right. If you don't have enough frequency and frequency has changed over the time, it used to be like, OK, you can do something six times a year, like send out six emails. Not and anymore. that's sufficient, Right. <laughs> so it really has changed depending on what you're doing. I mean, social Twitter, Twitter, it might be minimum three times a day if you're if that's who you're trying to reach with your audience or mm-hmm. Facebook several times a day and so on. And what are the right times of day? And now you can schedule uh, those things. And really, um, I heard uh, I can't remember who it is at this point in time. Uh, he compared, you know, advertising is now, uh, like Yellow Pages is now Google AdWords, right? And Was it Gary uh, Vee? Was it Gary <laughs> Vaynerchuk? I, I don't know. I don't know. I can't okay. remember who it was offhand if it was, because um, I've studied under this guy named Enix Singal, right? Mm-hmm. But I know it's somebody else. And then if you talk about TV, well, now it's YouTube, right? Radio or podcasts. And mm-hmm. so looking at that from a different lens, not mm-hmm. that that's 
that print is, is dead in certain ways, because you can look at in small towns, right? Community papers. They're still very popular, and advertising can work in those, and the Georgia Strait has survived, right? But uh, we are in this digital age, but sometimes having a combination of both can be more powerful, and it really comes down to what budget do you have? And as a grilled marketer, I believe looking with clients, like where are the most effective ways to market? And a lot of it might be it's in combination with sales because a lot of it is picking up the phone, right? When, so wouldn't you say like the best thing to do is find out where your ideal customers are and then use yes. those platforms? Yes, absolutely. As we really use, yes. like you said, we, we're it's similar like it used to be TV, now it's YouTube, it used to be radio, now it's podcast. So all that's really changed is how we consume information, but we're still really yes. using the same yes. senses. That's right. So inform is really about identifying who your ideal fans are so mm-hmm. that you can develop the the core message because if you don't know who your your ideal customers are yeah yeah yeah, because there's three ways that people fail in marketing right they don't have the right audience they don't have the right medium and they don't have the right message and Mm -hmm. if you don't have the right audience or customer target market or whatever you want to fan whatever you want to call it then the rest doesn't matter Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. so they and those three things have to exist so frequency is important and depending on who your clients are associated, if they're associated with Twitter. Like I work with clients that some that are in BPB. I've been working with a, a company that does POS systems. Well, LinkedIn. Just point of sale. Yeah, point of sale. Thank you. Know. Point of sale. Like if you <laughs> go to a grocery know, store and you sale. scan or, yeah, point of sale. Thank you. For that. I'm really not even an acronym person, but I taught myself. Um, so be, LinkedIn is really, there is the best area for them, mm-hmm. right? Facebook is really not going to be a good gig for them because it doesn't fit with who their audience is and who right. they're trying to reach. So, right. so frequency is the third one. Fourth is follow-up. And follow-up to me is paramount on everything. And this is where I see uh, business owners fail the most. It starts with the customer retention where they don't have a follow-up strategy. Then with customer acquisition, getting customers – it, it starts with maybe they are writing a really great blog, but there's no call to action. Mm-hmm. Or they're going to a networking event, but they're not doing follow-up or building relationships. So follow-up is paramount in every step along the way. And my question usually is, well, if you did this, let's say, we'll just say, if you did a blog post, did you ask yourself at that time, what was your follow-up strategy to that? Mm-hmm. Because if you're doing it and you don't have a follow-up strategy, then maybe why are you doing it? Like, is there really a point, right? So looking at that. And then the last is track. Because at the end of the year, when you look back at what you did, how do you know what worked and didn't work? And most small business owners do not know. They may have a gut feeling about it, but they Mm -hmm. haven't tracked it. They don't know. And I've been working in this industry for 16 years, and I see it time and time again. So do you cover those in your Crack the Marketing Code? Yes, all of those five steps are in the Crack the Marketing Code. And at the end of it, like there's templates every step along the way, right? So there's step, when we get to inform, which is the second step, the first two steps are the most vital. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at layering and how that is in your business currently and how you can improve it in the future. And then the second step, identifying who your ideal customer is going through this process to, to identify that fan. And then I have steps in how to create a core message. Mm-hmm. And then the other is frequency, follow-up, and tracker. Just like, they're just like the gravy, right? <laughs> because the first two steps are so vital. But follow-up is essential. So, yes, mm-hmm. all that and all the templates, you can reuse them over and over again. And at the end, you can use that what we call layering map to map out a plan for the next 12 months. And this is all online? It's all online. All and it, online. is it self, uh, self-guided or do, does it yes. have to start at a certain time? It, How it, does it work? When I, when I partner with an organization mm-hmm. and they promote it through their database, then I will have weekly calls. Okay. But in general, people can sign up for it and they can go through the program and they can complete it and sometimes there will be a special offer for people oh, cool. where if they complete all their assignments, then they will receive a 75 minute marketing strategy session with me. Oh, but cool. they don't get that That's until they complete it. Right. <laughs> and is... then there's emails that guide them through mm. during that process. So it depends if it's someone just logging on and signing up, then I will be in touch with them when they, when they sign in mm-hmm. and then I'll let them know that they can have access to me once mm-hmm. they complete right mm-hmm. so 
it, in those in that situation, it's a, a driven audience. Whereas for a chamber of commerce, for example, if within a chamber they're promoting it to their their membership, and people sign up, there's a specific start date, a specific end Got date, it. and there's you know, a it. different format, right? Cool. Yes. So we're going to make sure that we have the link to that program yeah. so the people that, that are interested good. yeah can go check it out. Yeah. So uh, click on the link that's in the notes below. And um, you also have a book, which yes. I bought. Yes, you did. And you I haven't finished it yet, but I it's oh, so good. easy to read and so useful. The tips are amazing. Yeah. List so, strategies, uh, quick tips, engage customers, and elevate elevate profits. Now, so what t- what was a what Can you get that you? online? Where can they yes, get they that? Yes, can, this can be purchased online. Amazon. Amazon. Ca. Amazon. dot com and uh, a lot of Amazons all around the world. Janet so, Tracy. That's right. Yes, I want it's to, a good book. Thank and it's, you. It's an easy read. Like I said. it is. It's like if you're standing in line someplace and you're just wanting to grab a few tips, and it just, easy to the, travel too. Yes, it's, it's light it's and thin, small. Yes, and that's the key for anybody that is creating a book. You want it to be thin because this book to mail it through Canada Post is around three hundred and sixty dollars in Canada and US would be super cheap. So. When you're, if you are writing a book, make sure that it is at the cheapest level to mail because some people that have odd shaped books, they've had to double the price on postage to send not it out. That. Right? Thank you for that. Yeah, too. yeah, it's very important. And yeah. the other thing is just going back to crack the marketing code for those people that really want to get more support. Mm-hmm. I have a program which has intensive. Uh, I call it implementation coaching. So that's a, a, we'll put both those links so people can choose what they think is best for them. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Just, you know, because so we talk value. about value, right? Yeah. So that depending on what people need. And that's that's important in terms of uh, I'm about to create a, a course called Stack Your Profits. And I think what happens is when people go, uh, when people talk to their customers, if someone come up to you and say, I'd like to buy a mug. Mm-hmm. And so you go, yeah, over there, right? There's the right. mugs. Yeah. But with with um, when people can say, well, what kind of mug do you want, and what do you need it for, and then say, well, you know, we have we have basically your basic mug, and that's seventy five, you know, well, ten dollars, let's say, and then we have the the ones with the that you can take in your car, which I don't like know, the, the tumbler, like yeah, yeah, the travel things, mug, right? yeah, like. <laughs> The thing is that your job as a business owner is to educate your custom, prospective customers or clients about what's possible and let them decide, right? And if you give them three different options, most likely they won't go with the lowest. They'll go with maybe the, the medium or the high, the middle, yeah. right? And, and this is something that I have found when I'm, I'm coaching clients. And I know it's sort of even though I'm under this umbrella as a marketing strategist because I've been a business owner for so long, work with so many business owners. There's, you know, it's a little bit more of a holistic approach that I take. But I think around the the pricing is that people get locked into just uh, answering a question mm-hmm. without really just like taking a breath and thinking about it, and then really thinking about what's best potential for the client. Because mm-hmm. if the client doesn't know what's possible. If you don't tell them and they don't know, then they can't buy it. And it's not sales. It's called education, right? And it's done like, it's sort of like a conversation. Exactly. So the customer doesn't go, ah, because that, that's also, I think, a lot of people are, a lot of entrepreneurs are afraid of the sales aspect. Because yes. they feel like, oh, I don't want to be pushy because it's the same yeah. as when you walk into a store and all of a sudden you feel assaulted by the person who's right. just desperate to get that commission, yes. right? Yeah. So, yeah. but... Like you say, it's just just find out what they really need. If you really come from that genuine place, yes, you're not going to scare. Yeah, it, right? and like some people want it in writing. Like they want to go back and they want to look at it on their own, and they don't mm-hmm. want to make that decision right then and there. So you have to know who you're talking to mm-hmm. and what their needs are. When I'm offering three different services, depending on what it is, when I'm pre- speaking, and I'm I will put together a, a very simple, like not an extensive proposal i don't i i have a rule i don't do uh rfps which are uh rfp is it like request propose request for proposal yeah. something like I, that i made a rule not to do those because you could spend a lot of time 100 hours putting together something mm. like that with mm-hmm. no guarantee and i mm-hmm. said i i'm not that's not part of my business model i will not do that mm-hmm. i will only prepare something for someone who has taken the time to sit down with me that i have some control over what that conversation is going to look like and that i can be myself and not try and fit into a box right 
right? Mm -hmm. And whenever I do the three tiers, I've been impressed with what the outcome is, right? And people just have to be in that place where they're, they're truly ready to buy or they realize that what you have is something that they need more than they imagined, that they needed it. You probably come across that too. Oh, all right? the time, all yeah. the time. So you went from pharmaceutical school training <laughs> to <laughs> to marketing, and then working with you know uh, helping uh, Sarah yeah. McLaughlin get famous. That's right. And now you're an entrepreneur, and you have all these programs that are amazing for all of us entrepreneurs. What's next for you? <laughs> That's a good question. Is it, you you, you seem question. to be always yes. in creative mode. You create yes. a person. You talk to, to space on a new pro program that you're starting. So what's next? Yeah. Well, two things. One is I'm realizing that uh, there's – I've been reticent to move into the business coaching field mm -hmm. because um, because marketing is, is near a strength. But over the years, I've realized that, like, my – skill set is well beyond marketing and I think some people are like well if they don't need marketing first um, I look at their situation and I say okay um, or what I what I've noticed I guess let me backtrack on that what I've noticed over the years is I can go into a company and they can say they need marketing but if they have other problems in their company that are deflecting them from doing sales and marketing mm -hmm. those things need to be dealt with first mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. and and I have the ability to assess that to determine because otherwise it's like the wrong solution so that's there's going to be more of that that I'm going to be doing and then I think like most of us like I've passed the, the well not like most of us like myself many people I passed the, the, the I'm over the five oh, right? oh so am I so, <laughs> so am it's I. like okay so then it's like well you know what 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 is in my destiny for mm -hmm. me and this is where i want to do something more personal i'll continue to do the marketing and i'll apply it to my business model uh, my vision is to create a membership website kind of a netflix style for mm -hmm. women that live with fatigue i live with ms i live with fatigue it impacts my life um i'm i'm able to work I'm able to have a good quality of life, but it has smaller than it used to be. And I know there's a lot of women that experience social isolation. So I want to create, I have a lot of ideas that I've written down and I, I'm working towards creating that is a place where women can come and feel understood for living with fatigue. In my case, it's MS and that they can have support of other people in that community, but that they will also, um, have an opportunity to feel more hopeful about their life. Not that, that their health will change necessarily, but around believing that they can still have a purposeful life. Mm -hmm. Because I, I know I have good friends that suffer like I do around fatigue, yet I see that they're stuck and it's because they don't have an anchor purpose. Mm -hmm. And it brings me great sadness. And also a lot of people are socially isolated. So the community is to help bring people together so they can connect with others online and eventually in person possibly, and also to lift us up so that we can all together be on this journey to feel more purposeful in our life. It could be as small as running a, a, a book club once a month online virtually because that's all you can manage to becoming a bigger part of the community to uh, working on this venture with me and being a paid employee. So, you know, the, the sky's endless so that's my that's my next big that's dream amazing. well you know what yeah. you are so inspiring like you're Thank full you. of energy like you you deal with health issues but you know if you didn't mention them no one would know yeah uh you are so driven and you you're a wealth of knowledge like with your experience and your background like I think anyone who's who's not going to go check out your program is crazy not to so <laughs> go check out Jen's program because she Thanks, is Francesca. a wealth of wealth 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 yeah. of knowledge and i want to thank you so much for uh for coming yeah. and you know agreeing to this because i just knew you would be bringing all this value and yeah so thank, thank you, you. Thank well you. i feel honored thank you so Aww. much for providing this this information and sharing it with the world you rock <laughs> So do you. You're my fan. <laughs> so I mean, just, I'm your fan. Just one last question. <laughs> yeah. If people want to go straight to your website, yes. where do they go? Yes. So that's liftstrategies.com. So L-I-F-T as in lift up strategies, plural.com. And that's with two Fs? No. Nope. One F. It's one, one F. F. L-I. <laughs> so it's like Larry Frank Igloo Tommy. 
strategies.com. Okay, awesome. So you heard it, you got it. You probably want to watch this again or re-listen to this again because you gave us so much information. I know I will be watching this and listening to this a few a few more times to absorb it all. Thank you so right. much again. Yeah, thank you. And thank every thank you everybody for watching. Till next time, bye. Thank you.